All right, who remembers my second failed attempt at the roll-up chair? Well, when it was time to pack up my old shop, I decided to disassemble it in the hopes that I could make something useful out of the material, and today is that day. It was tough deciding what my first project in my new shop was going to be, but a housewarming gift for myself made from the scraps of a failed project seemed like the perfect place to start. I began by rearranging all the planks so the pattern looked pleasing to my eye, and I was hoping to turn this into an end grain cutting board, so I paid special attention to the pattern on the end grain of all the planks. To make it easier on myself, and so you can see what's happening, I marked the direction the grain was running with a white pencil. Now that I was able to see more clearly, I rearranged all the planks again, creating an alternating grain pattern in the hopes that this will create a cool pattern once cut up, but honestly, I had no clue if this was going to be worth the effort or not. We shall see. Since these pieces were salvaged from my failed roll-up chair, there were holes in them. I thought maybe I can use these holes to my advantage when it comes to gluing up, so I ripped an almost eighth inch piece of walnut to turn it into an eighth inch dowel. I also thought this would be a fun challenge. Let's see if I can make super long eighth inch dowels without breaking them. I noticed the square stock wasn't going into my dowel plate easily, so I knocked off the corners with a block plane and now it went in perfectly. This was so fun and satisfying to do. Anyway, thinking ahead, all this material was going to be 14 inches wide after it's glued up. And my planer is a 13 inch planer, so I decided to split the glue up in half to make it easier on myself. Now, this was the first glue up in my new shop, and I hope it's not an indicator for how glue ups will always go in this new space. I couldn't find my small bottles of glue, so I just dumped out a ton of glue from my large container and spread it around with my hand. I do not recommend doing this. This was just way too much glue and it was a huge mess. I was hoping that by using the dowels, I wouldn't have to worry about keeping the planks aligned when gluing them up and the blank would be pretty flat. Not worth the effort, at all. Calls would have been way easier, but I'm glad I tried. Then it was just a rinse and repeat on the second half of the blank, and I put both halves in clamps using wax paper between the two so they don't stick together. I made sure to wipe up most of the excess glue before setting it off to dry overnight to help with the cleanup, which wasn't too bad. The dowels definitely helped keep the blanks flat, and I scraped away any glue residue that was sticking up so I didn't completely wreck my planer blades. The individual planks had roundovers on them already, so I just planed down to where there was no more roundover and I could prepare the two halves to be glued together. I planed the mating edges with a low angle jack plane until they were nice and square and found a small glue bottle so I was able to have a normal, non-stressful glue up. Once dry, I used a card scraper to remove any excess glue, and now it's time to turn this into an end grain board. But first, I need a crosscut sled. Since I got a new saw, I need all new jigs. I plan on building an ultimate crosscut sled soon, so this is just going to be a temporary, no frill sled that I slop together in about 10 minutes. After gluing two pieces of plywood for the fence, I cut a strip of maple the same thickness as the saw's miter slots for the runner, then use popsicle sticks to lift said runner up off the bottom of the miter slot and put some CA glue on it so it will temporarily stick to the bottom of the sled base. I could then flip the whole base over and permanently secure that runner in place with countersunk screws. Then I made a kerf cut, making sure to stop before I cut the whole base in half. Now I attach the fence using just one screw, then place a metal ruler in the kerf that was cut to pivot the fence and make it square to the kerf. Then I could screw down the other half of the fence. I did a test cut to see if the fence was indeed square, then locked it down with a couple more countersunk screws and that's all there is to it. Maiden voyage on the new temporary sled was a success. I squared up one edge of the board and now it's time to decide how thick I want my end grain board to be. I was aiming for about two inches thick, so I set up a stop lock at that distance, making sure to lift it up off the base of the sled so sawdust has a place to go. This ensures that all the cuts will be exactly the same and not be thrown off due to sawdust being stuck in the corner of the stop. I must say, this saw plowed through this walnut. It is just such a pleasure to use. Now I could finally see if all my planning with alternating the grain pattern was worth the effort or not. I flipped over every other piece and this pattern was absolutely insane. It's like a natural occurring chevron pattern. 
totally worth the effort. I wish I had more pieces with sapwood though because that's where the pattern really shined. Anyway, time for another glue up. This one went pretty smoothly. The only thing that I had to pay attention to was how all the pieces were lining up with each other. So a little tappy tappy here and there until everything was all lined up. And once again, cleaned up most of the glue squeeze out with a damp rag before setting it off to dry overnight. There was a little bit of cleanup I had to do with a scraper and a deep breath before all the sanding. Man, I wish it was that easy. Totally dreaming of a drum sander. So when I cut this board up, I was really only thinking about how thick I wanted it and didn't pay attention to how wide of a board those cuts were going to get me. And this board was a bit narrower than I wanted. No problem. I have some more pieces from the roll-up chair I can use to make it wider. I tried every which way to incorporate those dowels and the rounded grooves into this, but it all just seemed like it was too busy, so I cut them off and glued them into a stack. Once dry, I could trim them up at the table saw and was able to use the actual thickness of the main board to trim them to final width. I actually trimmed them to be like a hair thicker than the main board in case anything was misaligned during the glue up. I lost count as to what number glue up this was, but it was pretty straightforward and uneventful. Still dreaming of that drum sander though. Now, you may notice the center pieces are smaller than the rest. That's just how the material ended up, but it made me think of a really cool idea. I can incorporate some handles in that area. And wouldn't it be cool if those handles were brass? I sorted through my Dremel bag of brass and found this huge chunk that I could make into smaller chunks using a portaband. This is one of those tools that I don't use very often, but super glad that I have it when I need it. I was able to rip through this brass pretty quickly and easily, and then just clean it up at the bench top sander. I mean, the floor sander. To turn this area into a handle, I'll need to first notch it out further, and I thought it would look nice if the notch had rounded corners. This is very easy to do by making a template. You can make a template by drilling out some holes in the corners, then cutting out the waist of the bandsaw or jigsaw. This would then need to be sanded smooth to make it perfect. Or you can use a magic handheld CNC to make it perfect without any sanding. I opted to do the latter. I attached a template to the board using double-sided tape and cleaned it up with a template or pattern bit in my trim router. This bit can only cut so deep, so the rest is cleaned up by taking multiple steps. Remove the template and use the freshly cleaned up surface as your new template as far as the bit will go, and if it can't go any further, swap out to a flush trim bit that has a bearing on the bottom and turn the board upside down so the bottom bearing is running along your freshly cleaned up surface. I knew I wanted this board to have rounded corners and I could have added that on my handle template using the Shaper Origin, but I knew I already had this two inch radius template that managed to survive the move, so I decided to just use that instead. This time before routing, I knocked off the corners at the bandsaw and now I don't have to remove too much material with the router. Same deal as the handle template, temporarily attach with double-sided tape, use the pattern bit around all four corners, then remove the template and remove as much material as possible using the first cut as a guide. Flip the board over and swap to a flush trim bit to finish it off. Now for the brass handle. I'm gonna treat this like any other inlay. Making sure it was centered on the board, I used double-sided tape to hold it in place temporarily while I used a marking knife to mark its exact location. Then I could use the fences on my six in one trim router jig to cut the mortise. To set the fence, line up the edge of the bit with the knife mark, then adjust the fence so it touches the edge of the material and lock it in place. Then repeat the same thing on the other fence for the other side of the mortise. Now, all you have to do is take multiple passes while running the router along the fences. I just kept lowering the bit until I got to the bottom of the notch I made with the handle template and made the final pass. Then I flipped the board around and did the same exact thing on the other side. Doing this step now though, caused a little problem later on in the process when I tried to route the profile along the edges. You'll see. Anyway, the router leaves rounded corners and the brass bar is a rectangle. So the final step is to mark out the ends of the mortises with a marking knife and square them off with a chisel. For now, I just placed the brass halfway into the mortise because it would be pretty hard to get them out and I still need to do a lot of work on this board 
like the juice groove. I'm going to do this juice groove a little differently than you normally see. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So I marked out the location for where I wanted that juice groove to go. And if you're curious how I determined that location, I routed the profile that I knew I wanted on a scrap and did a few test cuts. One was too far from the edge and the other was perfect. Back to my board. I'm going to make a template that sits in the center of the board. To get the measurement of that template, I put a V groove bit in my router and placed its point on the line I just marked out. Then I could butt a square up against the edge of the router base, remove the router and strike a line along my square. Now I just had to repeat the same thing around all the other sides and I could measure the distance between all those lines and cut a rectangle that fits inside of there perfectly and temporarily attach it with double-sided tape. Before I route it though, I just need to address something. Typically you'll see people use fences on the outside of their boards to create the juice groove by running the router clockwise along those fences. But about five years ago, I put out a video where I kept messing up the juice groove because I was going counterclockwise. I was struggling to keep the router along the fence because I was going the wrong way. So even though I won't be making my juice groove this way, I need to correct this and show how it should be done. If you go clockwise within the fences, the direction of the spinning bit is pulling your router towards those fences and you won't have any trouble at all following the guides. Now that I routed this though, I can show you why I won't be doing it this way. Having the fences on the outside creates these sharp square corners in the juice groove and I just don't think that matches the curved corners on my board. So I'm going to be using the template in the middle that will create curved corners. Like I showed before, if you're following the inside of a fence, you run the router clockwise. But because I'm now running along the outside of this template or fence, I'm running the router counterclockwise. You always want the base of the router to run along your fence from left to right. So since I'm following the outside of this rectangle, I'm going left to right around the edge. When you're on the inside of the rectangle, you're still going left to right along the edges, except now you have to go clockwise in order to make that happen. I hope that makes sense. Back to the juice groove. You can see with minimal effort, I can move the router along the template and create a perfect juice groove. I take multiple passes to get to the final depth that I want, and then take one last teeny tiny little pass to clean up any burn marks or anything. Here you can clearly see the difference in the corners between using an inside or outside template. Template. The roundness just works so much better here. Time to route the profile on the edges. I mentioned earlier cutting the mortises would cause a problem. The bearing on my roundover bit would fall directly into those mortises, messing everything up. So easy fix. I put a temporary piece of walnut in the mortises and contemplated scrapping the brass all together and just going with walnut handles for a very brief moment. But instead, I rough cut the curve on them and placed them into the mortises with double-sided tape. Then I could clean those up with a flush trim bit. Problem solved. Now I can route this giant round over without worrying about the bearing going into the mortise. While this did give me an extra step to do, I still think routing the mortises before adding the edge profile was the way to go. Since I was using those fences on my router jig, it was best that I had square edges to reference off of. Now those little walnut pieces served their purpose and I was able to easily pop them out with a chisel. I just wanted to add one more detail on this board. I always wanted a board that had a corner well that collected all the juices. So I roughly sketched out the shape that I was after, then used my magic shaper origin to play around with a few different shapes until I landed on something that I liked and attached that to my board. For this cut, I used a core box bit that has a bearing on it so I can follow the template but still get those curved edges. I made sure to cut this well slightly deeper than the whole juice groove that I cut so the juices will flow down into it. I felt like it needed a gradual, more bowl-like feel to it. So I spent some time carving it out a bit more and used a gooseneck card scraper to clean it up. Remember, all this material was salvaged from my failed roll-up chair. So there were some holes I needed to fill and imperfections I needed to address. All of which I probably should have done when the board was still square, but whatever, it still worked. I made some walnut plugs, glued them in and cut them flush. Then I sanded for hours and hours 
where I got to contemplate all my life's decisions, like adding these curves on the inside of the handles. I sanded up to like 320, then raised the grain with a wet rag, waited for that to dry and sanded with my final grit of 400, where I was mainly thinking about how ironic it is to sand this thing to perfection, knowing full well it's meant for knives to cut on. Last little detail, I sanded and polished up the brass handles, then I glued them into place using CA glue. I was a tiny bit nervous that they wouldn't fit since I never did a full test fit, but they went in so perfectly. As for the finish, I went with regular old cutting board finish despite having just watched the Wood Whisperers cutting board finish video. I just didn't have the patience it would take to let the tongue oil cure, and I already had a bunch of this stuff on hand, but it's definitely something that I wanna try. If you don't know what I'm referring to, I'll link to his video in the description down below, it was very interesting. So with moving into a new house, setting up my shop, still needing to run my business and take care of my family, I don't have a lot of time to think about what's for dinner. That's why I'm so grateful for this week's sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic meal kit company with options for every lifestyle, including keto and paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. These delicious meal kits are delivered right to my doorstep, which means I don't have to go to the grocery store. Even better, all the ingredients are pre-portioned and the sauces and spices are all ready made to add chef curated flavor to a weeknight meal. Green Chef was always great, but now it's even better with double the choices. Every week you can choose from 24 recipes and you can mix and match from different lifestyles all in one box. Now, the moment that I have been waiting for, time to use my brand new end grain cutting board. Finally, I have a grown up cutting board. This is just so crazy exciting. Back to cooking. I love that Green Chef always switches it up. There is an ever-changing variety of these easy to follow recipes, which means that there's something new to discover each week. Like now I know my kids like ginger rice with edamame. <laughs> Amazing. It's really just an awesome convenient way to introduce my kids to more wholesome meals that I know are sustainably sourced. So if you want to try it out for yourself, use my code 3x3custom135 to get 100 and $35 off across five boxes, plus free shipping on your first box. Go to greenchef.com for more details. Once again, go to greenchef.com and use the code 3x3custom135 to get $135 off across five boxes, plus free shipping on your first box. Thanks, Green Chef. Now let's talk a bit more about this cutting board. You may notice I didn't put those rubber cutting board feet on it. Well, it's because I want to use both sides of the board. Now the board is pretty heavy, so I don't see it sliding around too much. But if you want to prevent a cutting board from sliding around, you just need to put a damp paper towel under it and it won't budge. Then you could use that paper towel to clean up, so no waste there. But I could always add the feet if I find that I need them. I know lots of people are probably already getting ready to type, but won't the brass tarnish? Well, yeah, probably. But I'm okay with a little patina. It adds character and it was worth it for me for the look I'm going for. Not sure if anyone else was as curious as me to see liquid flowing from the juice group into the corner well, but here it is. Then I got curious to see how much liquid all of this can actually hold. So I filled it all up with water until it spilled over and a very poorly attempted to pour it into a cup. Now I know, lift cup to pour. Well, half of it spilled out, but you get the idea. If your steak has more juice than this flowing out, you cut it too soon. And now, my most favorite thing about this board is the fact that you can still see all the flaws in the material that I use, so it's a daily reminder where this board came from. The material I used to try and make the second version of the roll-up chair gave me so much frustration and disheartment and now I turned it into something useful and beautiful that will aid in helping me take care of my family and that's all that really matters. I love that I was able to turn that fail into something we're going to enjoy using for years to come and I really just can't get over the pattern that I created with the alternating grain. Now that I got one small project done in my shop, I am ready for bigger and better. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. I love it.